Executive Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. All right, Warriors, for those of you who asked for an unsolved case last week and were disappointed when it didn't get picked, don't fret, because today I have just the case for you. But first, a few announcements. I am planning on doing some sort of meet and greet or a live Q&A with my patrons at the end of the month. So if you want to join in on the fun, join the Patreon fan club. You can join in for just a dollar a month. You can also join for five, ten, twenty dollars. There are different perks at each level, so you have to check it out. Sometime today, go to patreon.com slash military murder and see if any of the levels fit your needs. Just a note that there will not be a new episode next week, but don't worry, I want to tell you all about another podcast where you can catch me on while I'm away for a week. All right, for those of you who follow me on social, I shared a podcast which recently featured the Mama Margot story. In that podcast, I get down and personal and talk about all things Margot, my upbringing, my life goals, and I even share the reason why I joined the military. The podcast that I was featured in is called The Remarkable People Podcast by David Pasqualon. So if you haven't already checked it out, I highly encourage you to do so. So many of you contact me asking who I am, what I do in the military, but I don't often spill the beans until this feature. So check it out. But for those of you that listened, you know that my daytime job in the military is a military lawyer. Yeah, that's right. That's what I have done for the last 11 years of my life. But my fans don't really know that about me. And I didn't want to share it early on because most lawyers, you know, or many lawyers, I guess you can say they're stuffy and serious. And I am far from any of that. I don't take myself too seriously. In fact, I was voted a class clown growing up in school. So, well, growing up and going through college and law school and envisioning life as a military lawyer, there was one movie that stood out to me. And I was like, whoa, I want to be like that. And that movie was, you guessed it, A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise and Demi Moore. Goodness, I strived to be that. In the courtroom every single day, fighting for the little guy and giving it to the big guy, the real criminal, the guy who lurks in the back, never quite getting caught. Turns out, Real life drag is not as exciting as the movies portray it, but hey, it's still pretty cool. Well, did you know that the movie A Few Good Men is based on a true story? Well, not entirely. Some of the major facts were changed, so you can say that A Few Good Men was inspired by real life, but dramatized for the box office. Well, today, I am going to tell you all about the true story and the actual murder of one of the key players in that story that remains unsolved until this day. Join me today as I talk about the life and death of David Cox. Now, let's dig in. My sources for this episode include a 1996 Unsolved Mysteries episode on this case, a piece by the New England Unsolved, Boston 25 also covered David's disappearance back in 2019. Some additional articles that informed this episode include pieces in Variety, the Boston Globe, and the Baltimore Sun. There are two other podcasts that cover this case, and you can catch more information on those podcasts. And those podcasts are The Trail Went Cold and Trace Evidence. David Vernon Cox was born on November 27, 1966 in Massachusetts. David really never knew anything besides Massachusetts because that's where he grew up all his life. He was the youngest of three kiddos. He had an older sister and an older brother. By the time he became a teenager, things between his parents weren't good. And when he was 15, they divorced. David spent some time with his mom, but ultimately decided to bunk up with his pops. 
After he graduated from high school in 1985, David and his best bud, Jay, they decided to join the Marines together. And they did so under a buddy program. Whereas if you join the Marines together with a friend, you were guaranteed to go through boot camp together. And this is a pretty good deal, right? Considering that most of us end up in boot camp or training without knowing a single soul. Which, in my personal opinion and experience, is both intimidating yet exhilarating. You can reinvent yourself. It's actually a sweet gig, if you ask me. David excelled in the Marines, clean cut, and he followed orders to a T. He even attended Scout Sniper School. And if he joined the military to travel the world, he wouldn't be disappointed. In his short four year tour, he traveled to Panama, South Korea, and Cuba. And it was during his time stationed in Cuba, Guantanamo Bay to be exact, that David became a part of the most famous Code Red, at least most famous in Hollywood. In this situation, a Code Red means a senior person telling a junior person to, I don't know, kind of like take care of the situation, usually involving some sort of hazing incident or teaching someone a lesson, if you will. And the real reason why I brought up this story was because Last week, I brought you the story about Staff Sergeant Logan Melger, and I swear his case actually reminds me of the movie A Few Good Men. While in Guantanamo, David belonged to the Rifle Security Company, Windward Side 2nd Platoon. His specific duty was to guard the perimeter of the installation, you know, to keep it from being overrun. David was in amazing physical shape. And together with nine other Marines, they became a part of a group that called themselves, wait for it, the 10. (laughs) Real clever, guys. Real clever. In any event, the 10 participated in excruciatingly painful physical activity events that most of us would pass out from within seconds. Well, there was a guy, a member of the unit, but not a member of the 10. And he was really not digging. He wasn't feeling the Marine Corps. And he didn't like how they ran their business in Guantanamo. William Alvarado, that was his name. Well, he wanted out. He wanted to go home and he would do anything in his power to make that happen. But how much power does a private first class actually have? Not much. Well, William wasn't about that life. And he quickly escalated his complaints all the way to his congressman, which is his right. But William decided he was going to air all of the Marine Corps' dirty laundry. He allegedly mentioned the poor living conditions in Guantanamo, as well as some illegal activities, including Marines wrongfully firing their weapons into the Cuban city from their post in the base perimeter. Such a claim would clearly cause havoc if it was revealed to the public. But when the congressman came a knocking on the base commander's door demanding answers, nothing was done. Allegedly, William thought the congressman would work out a deal to bring William home. But the base commander said, no way. You, my friend, are staying put. And that's when a little street justice was activated. That's when the 10 were called to take care of it. There was a feeling that William was malingering, you know, pretending to be ill or to be mistreated because he wanted to get out of doing actual work. And that's a big no-no, especially in the military, because when someone doesn't do their fair share of the work, then others have to pick up their slack. It was late one evening in September of 1986. The 10 had just finished watching the movie Animal House, and they were feeling particularly frisky, if you ask me. William was in his room fast asleep. The 10 entered his room and quick grabbed him, taped him, blindfolded him, Then they gagged him so he wouldn't scream. The men then dragged a petrified William out of the room while they whooped his butt. But the plan wasn't over. They were going to ridicule William by buzzing off all of his hair and making him look like a new recruit. David Cox, he was in charge of the Clippers, so he took out the buzzers. And as David put the buzzers up to William's head, the group realized something was terribly wrong. William was choking on his own saliva and blood as his body went limp. The men immediately seized the assault and they ran for help, not worrying about themselves or what they were doing, but instead worrying about William. William was quickly treated and evacuated to Florida where he went on to recover from the assault. So he didn't die. And ironically, he got out of Cuba pretty quickly, if you ask me. 
even though I am sure that William would have much preferred to pack his own bags and leave on his own accord. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual, because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like, and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are, because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, and it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. There was really no denying which Marines were involved in assaulting and almost killing William. And well, the men weren't about that life. They weren't going to lie or try to cover it up. They admitted their guilt and command wanted to deal with the men and the crime as swiftly as possible. So all 10 Marines were allegedly provided with non-judicial punishment, or in other words, something that we call an Article 15. An Article 15 is basically a piece of paper that tells a person what they are being accused of. And I guess you can say it's like a mini paper trial, but not really. If you were to receive an Article 15, this is how it would go down. The commander gives you a piece of paper saying what uniform code of military justice section you violated. And then you speak to your attorney and you can either accept the Article 15 and say, yes, I did that. Or you can say, yes, I did that, but please have mercy on me. Or you can say, no, I didn't do that, but in an effort to avoid a court martial, I'm going to accept this forum. Or in the most rare of circumstances, you can say, "Uh uh-uh, hell nah, I did not do that, not me, not today. I want you to prove this in court. So just to be clear, if you receive and accept an Article 15, It's really just a military thing. It's not a conviction. It doesn't go in your civilian criminal file, but it does go in your military file and can lead to potentially being 
kicked out of the military or losing rank, losing pay, that type of stuff. So while it's not a conviction, it can still lead to significant impacts in your military career. Well, seven of the 10 men decided to accept the Article 15 paperwork and be on their merry way. But with that acceptance came the hard fact that they would be kicked out of the military with a less than honorable service characterization. But three of the men were not about that life. They knew they committed the act which caused William to almost die, but they had an excuse. They claimed they were told to conduct the code red on William. They were just following orders. And these guys thought that the person who ordered the code red should be held responsible, not them. And with that, they turned down the Article 15 and the command then brought the actions before a general court martial. And so the three men through their attorneys would have to argue that they were not in fact guilty of the charges. And during the four day court martial, the defense attorneys set out to do just that. David Cox was represented by a Navy JAG by the name of Don McCary. The same attorney who years later would represent Cooper Jackson, a man whose case I cover in depth in episode five, The Catfish Murder. And if you haven't listened to that episode yet, go back and check it out. It's one of the craziest cases I have ever covered. Anyway, Don McCary kind of thought it was a crazy idea to pick a court martial over the initial paperwork. But when he spoke to David about it, David was adamant. According to the Baltimore Sun, David told his attorney, I have nothing else. All I want to be is a Marine. Don told David, you could take this deal and go home. But David said, quote, no, I want to be a Marine, end quote. And Don McCory and the team must have been hella good because when the jury returned their verdict, all three men were acquitted of the murder and conspiracy charges. But actually, David was still convicted of a lesser included offense of simple assault and he was sentenced to 30 days in jail. After the ordeal, David Cox was able to return to the Marine Corps where he completed his commitment and he got the hell out of Dodge. He did receive an honorable discharge in 1989 and he soon returned to Massachusetts. It's safe to say that David Cox left the military with a little bit of a bad taste in his mouth. He was pissed that he had to defend himself when he was just following orders. Before this incident, David was a stellar Marine, but after the code read, he felt that his name was being dragged through the mud and he was happy to leave that life behind. Although he was the type that said, once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, while David Cox and the two other Marines were in court fighting for their life, there was a Jag who thought this story was fascinating and it just so happened that she had a brother who loved a good story. Actually. Her brother made a living from telling stories as a screenwriter, director, producer, and playwright. The Navy Jag was Deborah Sorkin, and her brother is Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin, according to his Wikipedia page, wrote a few pretty famous screenplays. You may have heard of Charlie Wilson's War, Moneyball, and Steve Jobs. He also wrote The Social Network about the story behind Facebook. Aaron heard from Deborah what went down in court and his brain was going a mile a minute thinking how amazing this could be as a Broadway play. And after changing a few major facts to make the story more compelling, a few good men was born and it debuted on Broadway. After a few successful months on the stage, Hollywood took notice and they bought the rights with the possibility of taking it to the big screen. And it wouldn't be long before Castle Rock Entertainment got what we now know to be an all-star cast, including Tom Cruise, Demi Moore, Kevin Bacon, and Jack Nicholson. Anyway, the movie debuts in Hollywood in December of 1992, and the facts, while similar to the Code Red called on William, there was one big difference. The Marine who was hazed in the movie A Few Good Men, well, in the movie, he actually dies. And the court martial of two Marines resulted in their dishonorable discharge from the military. David Cox got wind that his story made it to the big screen. So he got his little tickets to the show. He sat down. He's probably eating some popcorn and some soda and he's watching the movie. But by the end of it, he was disgusted. But mostly he was hurt. 
While the movie doesn't claim to be based on a true story, David knew the facts and now he was pissed that people would think that his victim was actually murdered. And even worse, they would think that he was discharged from the military with anything less than an honorable discharge. And that made him sick to his stomach. And the fact that his story was used and was now killing it in the box office, no pun intended, while he wasn't making a dime, well, that tore him up inside too. David actually went on the record and told Natam Bulletin, quote, if I hadn't known the truth, it probably would have been the best movie I've ever seen in my life, end quote. But David didn't do anything about his disdain for the movie. He went on with his life. After the Marines, he hauled some trash, he pumped gas, he worked odd jobs here and there, he attended bartending school, and he even earned a two-year paralegal degree. Eventually, he settled down with his girlfriend, Elaine Tinsley, and David tried to make ends meet, although he found himself unable to keep a full-time gig. For some time, David was also very vocal after leaving the military. He was talking to news reporters about situations in the military that he felt maybe were unethical. David's mom warned David to calm the heck down. She feared that he was going to be pissing a lot of people off by blabbing at the mouth, but David didn't want to hear that nonsense. Meanwhile, David wasn't the only one upset about the movie A Few Good Men. Some of the other OG hazers were pissed and they wanted to sue the movie company Castle Rock. Five Marines all joined together, Kevin Palermo, Ronald Peterson Jr., Brett Bentley, Dennis Snyder, and Christopher Lee Valdez. Well, they all filed a suit in Texas against Castle Rock. They thought Aaron Sorkin stole their story and they wanted $10 million in damages. The five members approached David and asked him to join in on the lawsuit. But David didn't want to rush in and he told the men he'd consider their offer. But he'd never get the opportunity to close the loop on that conversation. By early January 1994, David had been waiting on a job offer from UPS, a postal delivery service. David had a good feeling about this job, and he was so excited because on January 5th, he would know for sure one way or another whether he got the job or not. The night before he was scheduled to hear about the job offer, David and his brother Stephen went to the local Hands in Framington to watch a basketball game. David's brother picked him up because it had snowed a bit and it was going to continue to snow throughout the night. They stayed out for a bit, but then David was dropped off at home at around 10.30 p.m. and his brother just left. David walked into the house and because he didn't want to wake his girlfriend up or maybe it was because he was having some back issues, he decided to sleep on the couch. That night in the quiet of their town, the first snow of 1994 frosted the town over with eight inches of snow. Elaine, David's girlfriend, woke up in the morning. She saw David asleep on the couch. She left at around between 8 and 8.30 a.m., but she didn't wake David up. She figured she'd call him later to find out about the job offer. Elaine then called David at about noon. She was so eager to hear if he got the job or not. But the phone rang and rang and rang and nothing. But Elaine was able to remotely check their voicemail. And wouldn't you know it, David got the UPS job. Yay! Elaine was so excited to chat with David. He was going to be so stoked. That and the fact that he had just told her he was going to be joining in on the lawsuit. It seemed like David finally had a purpose in life again for the first time since leaving the Marines. Well, Elaine waited about an hour and she called the house again. Nothing. Elaine didn't think too much of it. She figured David had just went about his day. But Elaine's sense of everything's probably okay would soon turn into despair when she arrived back at the house at 5.30 p.m. And David wasn't home, but it was strange because his car, a 1988 Ford truck, was still parked outside. But where the heck was David? Another strange thing, David and Elaine had a pet rabbit who was usually kept in one of the rooms. But when she got home that evening, oh, Roger Rabbit was hopping around the house like nothing. <laughs> Actually, the rabbit's name was Lenny. Additionally, a few glasses had been knocked over and that just seemed very strange and out of place. Elaine quickly took to calling everyone and their mama, but no one had heard from David that day. Elaine decided to go check his car and when she did, what? She got even more suspicious. The keys were in the ignition. David's uncashed $400 UPS check sat in the car. 
and his 9 millimeter gun was in the glove box. But there was no sign of David, and there was no sign of a struggle. Instead of calling for help that evening, Elaine waited until the morning because Steve, David's brother, thought that David would return, and she, he basically said, calm down, everything's going to be fine. But after Elaine waited until the next morning and didn't see David, she finally reported him missing. The missing persons report was filed with the Natick Police Department. David's family asked the public for help, but there were never any clues. And David remained a missing person all through the winter. David was only 27 years old at the time of his disappearance. In early April 1994, the snow started to melt and spring began to peak its beautiful colors. Not too far from where David lived at the time of his disappearance, five miles to be exact, a canoeist was taking in the scenery while padding along the Charles River in Medfield, Massachusetts, when all of a sudden he saw something that, I don't know, kind of looked out of place. It was a white sneaker. It seemed out of place with all of the surroundings, so this guy pulled the canoe over to check it out. And when he did, the man began to move some brush around and boom, right there, he found a body. The body would later be identified as, you guessed it, David Cox. But how the hell did he get there and what happened to him? When David was discovered, he was wearing his camouflage jacket over a black hooded U.S. Marine sniper jacket and some blue pants. It was determined that he had been shot four times. And this was an execution. One of the shots entered his head through the back of the head. The other three entered his side on his torso. Due to the fact that David was left outside during various snowstorms, by the time he was discovered, his body had been pretty well preserved. Of interest to the investigators was that David's body was actually found between two gun ranges. So whomever chose this location knew exactly what they were doing because gunshots in a gun range would not be suspicious at all. But another puzzling thing was the distance of where David's body was found and the location of any potential car that drove them there. Investigators estimated that it was about a half mile or three quarters of a mile to where the cars would be. So this begged the question, did David walk to this spot voluntarily or was he held at gunpoint? Also, if David knew he was going for a hike in the woods during a snowstorm, would he actually wear his white sneakers instead of wearing boots? One thing was for sure, burglary was out of the question because David had his wallet on his person and in his wallet, he had $90 in cash. So whoever did this to him didn't do it for money. Sadly, since David's disappearance and his subsequent murder, the case has gone ice cold. Seriously, it's been 27 years by this point, and it doesn't appear that police are any closer to finding David's killer. But who wanted David dead? Throughout the last 27 years, people have speculated, and it appears that three theories seem to continue to emerge. One theory is that someone in the military did him in. Maybe someone who was mad that David was popping off on TV interviews about dealing with the Marines in Cuba. The second theory is that someone at UPS did him in. I didn't dig too deep into the theories, but apparently prior to waiting for a permanent offer from UPS, David was working for them temporarily. Apparently, while he was there, he saw some shady dealings and he reported them. It was something about a manager and a driver who were in cahoots and they were stealing packages. The third and final theory is that someone with the movie production company wanted to silence the five men who sued them and they silenced them by sending a warning and killing one person who was currently deciding whether to join the lawsuit or not. All three of these theories seem kind of absurd, but heck, so does this entire story. But there could be other theories. There's nothing saying whether they investigated the last known person who saw him alive, the person who lived with him, which was his girlfriend. Although it seems pretty clear that she has a strong alibi. It does appear that before he went missing, they may have had some sort of argument or fight, according to David's brother. So it just all kind of seems like there might be more theories that maybe we just don't know about. 
Back in 2015, there was a big push to reopen the case. And two state policemen by the name of Sergeant John Fanning and Trooper Yuri Bruhanik decided they'd take a fresh look at the case. They were both retired Marines and they didn't want to leave a fallen comrade behind. However, I have been able to find anything about an update from their fresh look back in 2019. Sadly, in reviewing newspaper articles from back in 1994 and 1995, Elaine and David's family called out the Massachusetts police for not doing enough in the first few days, hours even, of the disappearance. It had just recently snowed when David went missing, but apparently the police didn't take the missing persons report seriously. David's sister, Christine, told the Boston Globe that the police failed to interview neighbors and they didn't even bother to search the area in the first few hours of the missing persons report. That was left for the family to do, but by then it had already snowed an additional two or three times, so precious evidence was now gone. David's family has not forgotten him, and his older sister, Christine, told Boston 25 News, quote, David's life mattered. He was erased. This person erased his life, his future. I want the killer identified, not to us, to the world. I want everyone to know who did it. I want him to pay for it, end quote. If you or anyone you know have information about David's murder, any information, however small, can be helpful in this cold case. Please contact the Massachusetts State Police at 617 617- Five nine three eight eight four zero. The code red and hazing stories are super scary and freaky and make you want to watch your back real close. So just remain vigilant, y'all. Before I say goodbye this week, I just wanted to remind you all again that there will not be a new episode next week. My kids are on spring break and well, mama needs a little bit of a break as well. If you need more content in the meantime, check out that podcast of Remarkable People podcast where you can hear all about my story. You can also check out the Patreon fan club where there are at least seven bonus episodes starting at the $5 level. And there's more episodes as you increase in levels. And if you want to follow me on social media, you can do so on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast and on Facebook at Military True Crime. I want to take a moment to shout out my newest supporters. Canadian Cattertop, Stephanie R, Evan, Misty F, Terry J, Kim P, and Evan and the Gang Gang. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my boot camp and higher fan club members. This week's newest assistant producers are Jessica G and Leisha Q. And the music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next time. (laughs) Shh, let's work another podcast.